Without further ado, I'd like to um, introduce Dennis Loba. He will be talking about the Explorers, Indians, Refugees, and Settlers, The Road to Germana, 1650 to 1714. Uh, Dennis is known to the Germana Foundation mainly for his portrayals as Alexander Spotswood and Reverend John Thompson. Many of you may not recognize him because you've only seen him in those personas. He is a history graduate of Virginia Military Institute and a former active duty military officer with the Army. He also has served with the Virginia National Guard. He's an avid student of history his entire life and he specializes in 18th century material culture. He's a regular at many historical events, including Carlisle House, Mount Mont Plantation, Fort Frederick, Williamsburg, and numerous others. He credits his wife Donna in dealing with his continual historical crusades, um, as there's usually a pile of books that he's reading right next to his favorite chair in the living room. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, Dennis Loba to the screen. Hello, everybody. As Tim told you, I'm Dennis Loba, and today I'm hoping to cover some things that uh, hopefully haven't been covered before. Before I start, what I'd like to do is I'd like to dedicate this presentation to my wife, Donna, and my two daughters, who uh, usually do me proud every day. My wife of almost four decades has seemed to understand my addiction to history and has attempted to adapt accordingly. My two daughters, Melanie and Grace, um, help me a lot with this computer stuff. Uh, my daughter, Melanie, is solely responsible for almost everything you're gonna see today in this presentation. Um, her artistic ability and educational background have made this presentation, in my opinion, way better than I thought it could be. And I hope you'll agree when it's over. Thank you. When Tim Sutphin approached me about doing this some 10 months ago, I thought, could this really help me in my own struggles to separate fiction from fact when it came to Germana? Prior to this, I had had a hard time keeping things straight, not to mention I had a great many unanswered questions. Surely it couldn't help or hurt me, or you for that matter, if I was able to pinpoint some solid facts to better understand what had really happened. So with that as my goal, I sought out as much primary information as I could to piece the story together. Please understand that this presentation is not intended to be the end all be all as far as Germana, but an attempt to put more facts and ideas about Germana together to add to what we already know. It goes without saying that Germana and this man, Alexander Spotswood, will be linked together forever. My focus today will be the circumstances and the people who one way or another influenced the Germana core story. A simple background was required, so I chose 1650 as a beginning to set up the basics that will lead up to Germana's founding. For the most part, they will be explained in chronological order. Some things I'll paint with a fairly broad brush, and some things I'll go into to a lot of detail just to enhance the story and make it hopefully better. The magnet that was Virginia, I think, is best said as English poet Drayton's poem here. It is, of course, before my timeline, but I still think very important. And cheerfully at sea, success you will entice to get the pearl and gold in ours to hold Virginia, Earth's only paradise. The first character I'd like to start with is Sir William Berkeley. He was an Oxford graduate. He was governor of Virginia twice for a total of 28 years. He was also one of the Carolina proprietors. He promoted settlement in Virginia and the population increased from 8,000 to well over 40,000 during his tenure as governor. He encouraged distressed cavaliers and royalists to travel to Virginia. Additionally, there were increases in indentures, transports, which is the same as criminals banished, so to speak, to the colony and the slave populations. He supported further exploration of the frontier and beyond, and he also established frontier 
forts and ranger patrols to protect the frontier. This is a look of Jamestown, the capital of Virginia at the time, about 1650. I would be very remiss if I didn't mention Virginia's chief export and largest cash crop, tobacco, some 10 to 12 million pounds being sent from here to England and elsewhere during this time period. Berkeley would make his home at Greenspring, a large mansion between Williamsburg, future Williamsburg, and Jamestown. The view on the left is that mansion as it looked in the 1670s. The view on the top right, the 1790s as it was still standing. And of course, the map showing its location. I wonder if in 1710, when a certain Alexander Spotswood saw this place for the first time, he didn't get some future ideas about his own mansion. Johann Lederer. All right, any time on this presentation that you see a drawing framed like you're seeing here, it means that I could not come up with a portrait or a painting of this particular individual. And you're gonna see numerous ones. So when you see these drawings, that's what that's all about. Letterer was born in Hamburg. He was a Hamburg educated physician. He immigrated to Virginia in 1688. He spoke multiple, Engl multiple language and learned English after arriving in Virginia. Governor Berkeley appoints him Virginia's explorer of the Western frontier. His final expedition, which is the most uh, probably concerning us, is the Rappahannock River Valley. Letterer relocates to Maryland after completing three sex successful expeditions to Virginia and Carolina. He then goes back to Germany and remains there the rest of his life. Here we have pictured the front cover of Letterer's journal, which he did not publish, by the way, uh, was translated from his Latin version by Sir William Talbot, who was then governor of Maryland. And, and that's how it got published. And it's, uh, it's got this map in it that you see here showing his three trips. If you look closely on the right-hand margin of the map, you'll see a red line. And that's the one most applicable to us. That's his Rappahannock Valley River trip. I thought this was an excellent quote uh, to, to share with you. The 14th of March, 1669, from the top of an eminent hill, I first decried the Appalachian Mountains, bearing due west to the place I stood upon. Their distance from me was so great that I could hardly discern whether they were mountains or clouds until my Indian fellow travelers, prostrating themselves in admiration, howled out after a barbarous manner, Oki Posi, God is nigh. The marker that I've shown here is one that's out near Front Royal, Virginia, uh, showing uh, or in recognition of, of letterers uh, at least traveling through to that point. The barrier for exploration. Without question, the Blue Ridge and the Appalachian Mountains were a formidable barrier, not only in their size, but in their features, heights, et cetera, et cetera. They would stop the English from going west, and they also would stop the French from coming east. I would be very remiss again if I didn't cover the French aspect of North America and its influence on Germana itself. Here we see Jean Talon, who was the second in command of French of, the, of New France, and he staged a pageant up in Michigan, now Michigan, at the eastern end of Lake Superior, where he claimed all of that area, the Great Lakes area, gave canoe loads of presents to the Indians and claimed the region without question for King Louis. The two major French ex expeditions at the time, which I've, I've shown here, 
are the Marquette and Joliet one of 1773, and then Robert LaSalle, who went on a series of, of uh, trips between 1679 and 1687. Bear in mind that these things are going on while, while Letterer is out exploring the Blue Ridge and the Appalachians from the east. Marquette and Joliet would explore the Mississippi River from the Lake Michigan area all the way to the Arkansas River. Robert LaSalle, on the other hand, would not only explore the Ohio River Valley, which in our terms is fairly close to home, as well as sail the first, build and sail the first sailing ship on the Great Lakes. He would also later travel down the Mississippi River and all the way to the Gulf of Mexico and basically claim all of that area for France. A major sideline to all the North American exploration was the Indians and the fur trade. Beaver was king and gentlemen liked their beaver skin hats. And the Indians on the other hand, they liked the things that were new and available to them as cooking pots and utensils, beads and trinkets, guns and ammo. So it was a, uh, it was a benefit, a mutual benefit for both parties. And this is with the French and British and their allied Indians. At this time in the 1670s, there's a lot of Indian trouble from Carolina and especially on the Virginia frontier in the Northwest area above the Carolina border. The Indians would rebel against land encroachment and unfair trading purposes and practices, and they would kill and carry off several hundred European settlers. Look closely at the warriors. Note the benefits from their benefits from the fur trade, guns, clothing, and trade silver. Next, we have Bacon's Rebellion of 1676. And Bacon's Rebellion was pretty much a direct result of the Indian problems on the frontier. Uh, Governor Berkeley was where, well aware of the problems, but didn't do a whole lot about it. So rising to lead is the disgruntled Nathan Bacon. Bacon is a formidable fo foe. He gathers up some pretty large forces. He forces Governor Berkeley to flee Jamestown. Bacon burns Jamestown and then proceeds to basically take over. His untimely death very suddenly ends the rebellion and Berkeley then hangs most of the troublemakers related to it. Now this man should be somewhat known to y'all, George Hamilton, the first Earl of Orkney, Scottish nobleman, governor of Virginia. Look how long he was governor. I never realized myself he was governor way before the war for Austrian succession or up to almost the time of Spotswood's death. He's the Duke of Marlborough's most trusted general and he's a, named the first field marshal in the British army. Now, if you've ever wondered why the refugees, the Segan ones and others were in London, these three wars should be an excellent indicator of that. These three wars you can see lasted from basically 1620, almost 100 years to 1714. And they had a devastating effect, especially on Germany with 20% of the population being lost to death during these wars. If you can imagine 40,000 to 90,000 soldiers foraging, marching and battling in Germany, Austria and the Low Countries, you can kind of get an idea of how people would be displaced by the thousands. These refugees, or at least some of them, will figure prominently in our story later. Franz Ludwig Michel, born in Switzerland, burned Switzerland from a prominent family. His father was a member of the council and a prefect of Godstadt. He served in the military, possibly an officer in the French army. From 1701 to 1707, 
He makes three voyages to explore America. During one voyage, he acts as the agent for obtaining new land for the burned government so its paupers, anti-Baptists, and convicts could be resettled. He had a natural propensity and curiosity toward American mining, minerals, and possible precious metals. And he also secures mining mineral rights in Carolina, Virginia, and Pennsylvania. Make note of this man with the idea of mining. He meets John Lawson, who I'll cover in a minute, and Christoph von Grafenried in London at those two dates. He authors a short report of the American journey and eventually dies among the Indians. These are some pages out of Michel's journal. Uh, his journal was not written by him. His brother Hans took his maps, et cetera, and put this thing together. Uh, there's, it's, it's, it's a really neat journal and it's got some interesting things about it concerning the Indians, et cetera. The first refugee settlement in Virginia, known as Manikin Town or King William Town. Former Monacan Indian village. It is a frontier buffer, and you're gonna hear me say that a lot today or a number of times for the James River Valley. Several hundred French Huguenot or Protestant inhabitants are there. One Virginia militia company is located there. There's a coal pit discovery there just by accident along the, the James River, which will later be exploited. And Franz Ludwig Michel visits there in 1701. I wanna show you this map because, and it's a little early in our, in our order here, but this is a 1707 map that Franz Ludwig Michel does of the Shenandoah Valley. And what I've done is, I've put three things, major landmarks on this to help you see how accurate, unbelievably so, this map is. If you noticed at the top, I've got Front Royal at the forks of the Shenandoah. A little further down, you see Harper's Ferry, West Virginia, at the fork of the Shenandoah River and the Potomac. And then down towards the bottom, you see the falls at Great Falls. Queen Anne. Queen Anne is very receptive to the refugees that are coming from the European continent. She reigned from 1702 to 1714. She was the last monarch in the House of Stuart. And as I said, she embraced the European refugees, especially the Palatines, due to her marriage to the Protestant Lutheran George of Denmark. She provided shelter, food, and money to support the 10 to 15,000 refugees converging on England due to the wars on the European continent. Certain lands on the Southwest branch of the Potomac are granted by her to George Ritter Company for possible settlement and mining. And this is an important one here, the bottom one. She personally introduces Graffenreed to Spotswood at a gathering on account of Virginia affairs in 1710. Now I'm going to talk a little about the Pal Palatine refugees in London. 10 to 15,000 refugees are there. Um, 23 acres, if you look at the bottom picture, you'll see a series of tents and some people that look pretty miserable, and you'll see a dashed line. That particular area, which is right next to the Tower of London, some 23 acres, is where the majority of these 10 to 15,000 refugees were, okay, right in the shadow of the Tower of London. Here's another picture of the refugee camp. Please notice the military style and the military tents. This wagon is handing out bread, and it looks like there's a military officer standing right next to the wagon. The cover of the book that I've got here, The State of the Palatines, is a is, a, is an excellent kind of a sideline reading about 50 years of the Palatines being refugees in London. And you'll see the picture that you saw on the previous slide of the military camps and some of the refugees. Savoy Chapel. This chapel, which is still in London and exists today, 
you see on the upper right hand picture, and then you see a period picture on the top left. This church served the German Lutherans and the refugees as a church that they pretty much were given and taken over to do all their sermons and their church uh, learning. Uh, and it's still there today. The Reverend Joshua Harsh or Joshua Huckendall. He is an important figure for nothing else that he writes this book, which I show the cover here, a complete and detailed report of the renowned district of Carolina located in English America, which was, I'm reluctant to say a bestseller, but it was extremely popular among the refugees. And it was basically saying what a wonderful place Carolina was to go to. He arrives in England in 1708 to plead the Palatine cause to the Board of Trade and Queen Anne. He brings two Palatine groups to the Mohawk Valley in New York in 1708 and 1710. The four chiefs. Now the reason I've included these four chiefs is because one, their visit to England was a very important one. They all had their paintings painted as you see here in their different regalia. They were present when George of Denmark, Queen Anne's consort, passed away and all wore black to his funerals. But more importantly, they visited the refugee camps along the Thames River and saw the Germans all piled up there in their tents and barns, etc. So they visit that, that particular area. Uh, and later refugees from Palatine re refugees from that camp end up on the edge of their territory in New York on the eastern end of the Mohawk Valley. John Lawson, born in Scotland. He's a graduate of Gresham College. He's an English explorer and author, a private sur surveyor, and a deputy surveyor. He meets James Pettiver and agrees to collect botany special specimens in Carolina for his collection. It was a big thing in the 18th century. Uh, some of these gentlemen were really curious about natural, the natural uh, botany, et cetera. So Lawson collects things for this particular man and some of his collection, and I'll show you uh, one book here in a sec, uh, are part of the British Museum. He is the author of A New Voyage to Carolina in 1709. His first trip to Carolina, he joins a party that explores the back country from Charleston to New Bern around 1700. He ends up being the surveyor general of Carolina in 1708. He returns to England in 1709 and meets Franz Ludwig Michel and Christoph von Grafenried. Lawson ends up being a founder of both Bath and New Bern, North Carolina. He returns to Carolina in 1710 bringing Grafenreed's Swiss and Palatine refugees there. He's captured and killed by Indians in 1711, and I'll go into detail about this, but this is actually uh, what, is, what is believed to be a painting of Lawson himself. I mentioned Lawson's journey. Uh, you see on the left from Charleston, he takes a pretty good like half circle trip all up through what is called Carolina, which is now South Carolina and North Carolina, and ends up on the Noose River up near New Bern. Here's the cover of his uh, new voyage to Carolina. And then the book that I told you had some of his specimens in, in, the, in the British Museum. This is actually a copy of what it looks like today. Christoph von Grafenried. This man will play probably a more important role in Germana than any of us, uh, more especially me, realized. And I'll go into great detail about that. He was born in Warb, Switzerland. His father was Lord of Warb and a minor governor, government official. He studied at the universities of Heidelberg and Leiden. His father sent him to England, and I, I like how this is worded, to make respectable connections in all circles. He is well received by the upper class even befriending the Duke of Albemarle. His good nature, charisma, and charm are his best attributes. And that's without question. He earns a degree from the University of Cambridge in 1682, 
he meets and befriends John Lawson and Franz Ludwig Michel in London. He becomes a partner in the George Ritter Company with Franz Ludwig Michel in 1710. Now, with his connection to George Ritter Company, the proprietors of Carolina, he acquires 15,000 acres, five that he buys outright on his own and the other 10 from the proprietors, which bestows him on the title most of us know him by, either Landgrave or Baron. And part of having that kind of land in Carolina gives him that title. He befriends Spotswood and attempts to settle his refugees in Virginia. He returns to London in financial ruin with creditors in pursuit, 1713, and authorizes relation of, excuse me, and authors relation of my American project about 1716. Now, some of those were a little, little ahead of the game, and I'll go into great detail about the last final three uh, here coming up. I would be, again, remiss if I didn't explain that all of these gentlemen, including Spotswood, you know, Lawson, Graffenreed, all of them, they hang, hung around in all the same circles and saw a lot of each other around town in the coffee houses, uh, in the uh, uh, sports where they might have cockfighting or horse racing, et cetera. These men were no strangers to each other. And usually the people involved with Virginia uh, would, would have kind of a Virginia delegation that hung around together or the Carolina delegation or a combination thereof. George Ritter, born Switzerland. He's a Spätzier, which is a German word, which means specialist merchant of pharmaceuticals, which included species of exotic spices, okay, which I found rather interesting. He forms the George Ritter Company about 1704, 1705, with two major goals, land speculation and profit from colonial mining. Franz Michel and Graffenried become his partners in 1710. William Penn, now some of you might be saying, what's William Penn got to do with Germana? Well, I'll show you. He's born in London. He's a former officer in the British Army. He's an early member of the Religious Society of Friends or the Quakers. He takes over his father's land grant, which his father got from Charles II, and he founds the Providence, the province of Pennsylvania. He's very interesting in mining and mineral explanation exploration in Pennsylvania. Franz Michel first approaches him about a mining and minerals commission, but Penn is very skeptical of him. And it's not until Michel brings Graffenreed in to help that he grants the commission in Pennsylvania. This is all while they are in London. Penn later remarks about Michel, oh, for I fear Michel has tricked us all. That, that might be a hint of things to come. I thought this quote by Penn is, is, again, another good description of the Baron. Having mentioned the Baron Graffenreed, I must particularly recommend him to thy favor and notice as a gentleman of worth that having made a very good figure and borne very considerable offices in his own country is now willing to retire and plant himself in a land of more freedom and ease. Of course, Penn means Carolina. All right, the next thing that, has, ha, that happens in our order is the lawson Graffenreed voyage to Carolina. These men know each other very well, and Lawson volunteers uh, because he wants to go back to Carolina. He is the survey general. He volunteers to take the first two ships from London of Swiss Palatine refugees to the area that they're gonna settle on the Neuse River. So he takes two ships and starts out on the voyage. About a month later, Graffenreed follows him. When Lawson gets to the Hampton Roads area, a French privateer comes up on the two ships carrying the refugees and, and boards one of them, stripping the 
um, the all members of the crew as well as the refugees on board of everything pretty much that they own, some even their clothing. He later makes his way after this incident to Carolina. Graf and Reed arrives about a month later and takes the time to stop to go to Williamsburg and pay his respects to Spotswood. However, Spotswood is not home and Graf and Reed turns around and heads to Carolina himself. Now, when they get to Carolina, Michelle is also present there. Johann Justice Albrecht. Now, this is a bit of a mystery, man, and I've heard other Germana descendants say the same thing. Um, he's born in Germany. He's possibly an employee of the George Ritter Company. He's a mining, mining specialist, inspector of mines. Notice the question mark, chief inspector of mines. He prepares the Segan donation contract, and I'll show you that in a minute, in 1711. And he also prepares the shareholders book in 1712. He's later arrested with his clothes and tools in Germany, but is released after the British ambassador or envoy there intercedes on his behalf. He and Franz Ludwig Michel are possibly business partners. I'm not really sure. He premature later and without Grafenried's blessing brings the Siegen Germans to London in seven, September of 1713. This is the Siegen donation contract. I'm sure many of you have seen it and the woodcut behind is Siegen in the late 1600s. This document basically signed by all of the local ministers says to them that if we find minerals and we find mining uh, is very profitable, that we'll share in our profits with you. It's, uh, it's kind of a sweetening document just in case anybody wants to leave Siegen and come to Carolina or be a part of it, that the area will benefit from it. Next, we have the shareholders book. And this is about a four-page uh, booklet that Albrecht did in London in 1712. And basically, it's given the rules if you, uh, if you want to be a shareholder uh, that, you know, here, here's, here's what we're offering you, okay? The picture next to it is of some miners of the, about the time period, uh, how they would have dressed. Alexander Spotswood. Just the basics here, as we all know this man well and, and basically his part in the whole thing. He's born in Tangier, Morocco. He's an ensign through a lieutenant colonel in the British Army. He's wounded and captured during the War of Spanish Succession. He's paroled and exchanged. He arrives in Virginia as Lieutenant Governor in 1710. The News River Expedition. After founding New Bern and doing the initial setup, John Lawson asked Graffenreed to go with him up the news to see if there might be a way to Virginia, et cetera. That was one of the difficult things with the Carolina settlement was they were always looking to find their way to Virginia or go to Virginia to carry on trade, get supplies, et cetera. The Carolina proprietors at this time are without question ineffective, distant, and don't seem to really care about what's going on in Carolina as long as it's kind of quiet, so to speak. About this same time is the beginning of the Tuscarora and allied tribes becoming uneasy and volatile and will lead to a major Indian conflict. There is also a feud between two rivals for governor in Carolina and the Indians will choose sides with, sides with them and that won't help either. Before departing on this expedition, Graf and Reed will ask Lawson if the Indians where they are going would pose a danger. Keep that in mind. Well, the Indians do pose a danger. 
Uh, they're up the News River, and all of a sudden some Tuscaroras come out to the edge of the, of the river and uh, apprehend Lawson and Graffenreed. And uh, they take them and interrogate them several times. Lawson, unfortunately, gets in a vigorous argument with one of the chiefs. And as an insult, the Indians take off both of their wigs and their hats and they throw them in the fire. This drawing shows Lawson, Graffenreed, and Graffenreed's black servant in front of the fire captive. And this drawing is either is from Graffenreed's uh, relations of my American project. Uh, they think, uh, most scholars think that either Graffenreed drew this, but I'm more inclined myself because of the drawing to say it was Franz Ludwig Michel. Lawson is later carried away and executed, and Graffenreed does not witness all of that. It's, it's said to be, uh, have been fairly gruesome. Graffenreed, negotiation, ransom, and release. Graffenreed's in Indian hands about two months, and Spotswood gets wind of it, and he sends Peter Poithes, a well-known Virginia trader out, to bargain with the Tuscarora and release Graffenreed. Spotswood at this time also calls out the Virginia militia, some 1,600 strong, and they march down to close to Nottaway and muster there. Spotswood demands Graffenreed's release and writes a pretty pointed letter uh, saying that he'll uh, do bad things to the Indians if they don't release him, and they ignore him. Graffenreed negotiates his own release by promising a big ransom uh, to the Tuscaroras. Meanwhile, unbeknownst to Graffenreed, the Indians have attacked New Bern, his settlement there, and killed and carried off many of his Swiss palatines. Graffenreed arrives in Virginia. Because of the now extreme conditions at New Bern, no food, no shelter, and the threat of the continual threat of the Indians, Graffenreed turns to Virginia. He contacts Spotswood and comes to Williamsburg. His reasons, one, to find a new settlement place for Swiss Palatines, and two, to look for the possible Michel mines, sites, and minerals that he has been previously told about by Michel. Graf, Graffenreed's expedition. He confers with Spotswood about all of his plans, including the mines. He also, it's his intention to find and explore the areas granted by Queen Anne to the George Ritter Company for possible settlement. He also tells Spotswood, and this is fairly important, that he has some relatives and by their interest can procure skillful workmen out of Germany for carrying on the works, meaning mining. He finds no mines or and or minerals on this trip. He, he now knows that because of the Culpeper Fairfax land grant and the conflict with that and the lands granted by Queen Anne, that he'll have to locate, relocate his settlers so remotely that it's just not worth it. And they will also be subject to unfriendly Indians. So he now realizes after, been, after he's been gone for three months that he must scrap all ideas as re, of resettlement as well as any gain from mining or minerals. And again, I show the Michel map of 1707, um, which he probably had with him when he went. From Virginia, Graf goes back to Carolina, he comes back to Williamsburg and he goes back to Carolina and finds everything there still in turmoil. He informs Michelle of the Upper Potomac situation, and believe it or not, Michelle suggests moving to the Gulf of Mexico or somewhere very remote, which of course is out of the question. Graffenreed is now in financial ruin. He spent his money on the necessities for New Bern. He's heavily in debt, 
So he turns over all of his land holdings to his creditors and others and reluctantly leaves New Bern and comes back to Virginia. Graffin reads farewell. He comes back to Virginia and he stays with friends in Williamsburg for about six weeks trying to get some help, financial, etc. It does not happen. After deciding to return to London, he sells his silver flatware for money for the trip passage. He exchanged gifts with Spotswood. Spotswood gives him Colonel Blakiston's name to possibly help him when he reaches uh, London. And on Easter day, he sets off on horseback to New York City where he books passage to London, arriving there in August, September of 1713. Colonel Nathaniel Blakeston is born in England. He's an acting, was a Colonel in the British Army, served in the West Indies. He was Lieutenant Governor of Montserrat Island in the West Indies. He was Governor of Maryland and retired due to health problems. He was Colonial Agent for Maryland for four years. At the present time, he is Colonial, colonial Agent for G Virginia and he serves as the liaison between Spotswood and Orkney, the Board of Trade, et cetera, presenting packets concerning whatever is going on officially in the Virginia Assembly, uh, et cetera. He is instrumental in making arrangements and financing for the Segan Germans to come to Virginia. The Segan Germans in London. They arrive approximately September 1713. About six weeks after their arrival, Graffenreed her, hears about them and arranges to meet with them. Now bear in mind, Graffenreed, his idea was that they would be sent for and come when they were sent for. So if you look at the quote underneath of this picture, they caused me not a little pain, worry, vexation, and expense. Of course, I've already told you who brought them to London early, and that was Albrecht, okay? So Grafenveer suggests the following, that they immediately go back to Segan for the winter and return in the spring, which due to their resources, financial resources, is an impossibility. That they pool all their money. He actually goes out and finds them work on a dike and some other menial labor jobs just to help support themselves. He makes sure they have shelter in the refugee camp. He will seek out Colonel Nathaniel Blakiston for possible passage. He will write Lieutenant Governor Spotswood, which he does do. He will make the financial arrangements for their passage at 150 pounds sterling and help out with their other living expenses. It's also at this time that they inform him that they will incur four years of servitude to go to America. I think this is a, probably one of the best quotes that I came across in all of this. And it's a graphing read one. I am sorry for the poor miners who have left a certain thing they had in Germany to go to find the uncertain in America. In a place of good vocation that they have, they had nothing at present except what they can gain from some cleared land where they are obliged to live modestly. I guess if anybody would know about that, it would be Graffenried. Makaja Perry, born in England, he's from a very, very, very wealthy London family. He himself, a London merchant and ship owner. He's the founder and principal partner of Perry Lane Company. He has extensive trading links with Virginia. His company was partly responsible for financing the construction of William and Mary College. He had control over the bulk of the Virginia tobacco trade, and he's known to such individuals as William Byrd, Spotswood, Blakiston, and others. Graffin Reed mentions two merchants responsible for financing the Segan Germans passage. Most likely, it was Perry Lane. The Segan Germans passage to Virginia or America. 
At their landing, the governor was to accept them and look out for paying the captain who should pay them back to the merchants of that country the money they advanced, settle themselves according to wise arrangements and under the helpful supervision of the governor, meaning Spotswood. Constructing Fort Germana and Sister Christana, Fort 1714. These pictures are just to give an idea of the kind of construction practices, et cetera, that these, both of these forts would have been subject to. The colony built both forts, both pentagons, at roughly the same time. Both would serve as buffer forts for the frontier. They were probably constructed by contracted labor and woodsmen, definitely at colony expense. Fort Germana itself. Well, we all know about the Fontaine description that all of us know that, so I won't go into that. Most likely, Fort Germana got occasionally visits from rangers that were on the colony's patrol force. And also one interesting thing, Spotswood mentions that he has brought two cannon there. Well, about three years earlier, Spotswood had ordered two brass barreled three pounders on field carriages. I wonder if those are the two cannon that ended up at Germana. These pictures, while they're not Germana, these photographs of these different houses, et cetera, are meant to give an idea of, of possibly how it looked there. And as you can see, uh, it's, it's, as Graf and Reed would say, very modest. And of course, we've all probably seen this quote. I continue all resolve to settle out our tributary Indians to guard ye frontiers. And in order to supply that part, which was to been covered by the Tuscareros, I have placed here a number of German Protestant, Protestant Germans, built them a fort, finished it with those two pieces of cannon and some ammunition, which will be a good barrier for all that part of the country. I think it's fitting as an end to this or close to an end to this, uh, this presentation to show you this quote by Washington. It's probably more fitting now than it's ever been as our country go, grows and its population it increases as it will, care must be taken to have each succeeding generation know the trials and tribulations of those who preceded them. History is an essential study to better government. In closing, it is my sincere hope that all of you have even better understanding of the road to Germana. It covers great geographical distances in its origins, as well as the extreme social and political upheavals of that time. The major personalities are literally from all walks of life, some motivated, some motivated by the human core value of self-preservation, while others by financial gain. Their attributes are everything one could expect from an exceptional story, adventurous, suspect, compassionate, greedy, ambitious, and in some cases, undoubtedly brave. A good many were quite willing to gamble with their own lives for a better one. It's a great story even after 300 plus years, those 42 Germans living modestly in their remote fort on the Virginia frontier. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Um, I am Ashley Abruzzo. I'm the membership manager for the, the uh, Germana Foundation, and I'll be here to ask the questions that you're sending into the Q&A box to Dennis. Um, Dennis, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Everybody's saying how great it was, great story. They love the images, the maps, the backgrounds. A um, lot, of, lot of great comments. Um, so we have a few uh, questions here in the comment box. Um, Fran has a couple. Um, she was curious to know whether or not our ancestors would have lived in the tents near the Tower of London, if that was something maybe others would have done, and what did they do for work while they were waiting to come to America? Yes, uh, the chances that they lived in that refugee camp, those, those 23 well-populated acres, 
I would say is probably 90% plus. Um, most of them hired out doing all kinds of menial labor, um, whatever they could. Uh, just, you know, they were, it was, it was, it was a desperate situation. Mm -hmm. So I would say, you name it, they did it from probably, uh, well, the, the Seekin Germans worked on the, a dike for a time being, and I didn't mention it, but the, uh, the, there was a bunch of rain as they were started on it, and it partly washed out uh, uh, while they were working on it. So it kind of went by the wayside. Oh, my goodness. Um, I know we, we briefly heard about the Ziegen donation contract. Fran wanted to know, was the donation contract something that was a general contract? Were there more different types of donation contracts that existed by chance? Uh, I only know of that one, and it's only because of its, you know, its connection with Germana. Um, it would not surprise me that that contracts like these were were written about a lot of things, um, but you know, if if things were found according to that document, if things were found in in America, in particular Carolina, um, you know, the Segan town. Uh, would benefit from it. And uh, Mark was curious, what do we know of the end of the George Ritter company? Did they have to file articles of dissolution or file for bankruptcy? That I don't know. I only, my only uh, study on them was to, you know, through this particular time period to 1714. Um, Ritter himself was, uh, uh, was a very wealthy man and dealt in, uh, um, you know, something that would cost people to, to buy. So as far as it hurting him, uh, I don't think so. But I, I don't know anything about uh, that company dissolving in particular. Okay. And again, we've been having a lot of people loving the information. Um, would you be able to share um, copies of your notes to individuals who would be interested in kind of maybe doing other, <laughs> other individual research on the topics? Well, if they saw my notes, they would say, how in the heck did you read from them? <laughs> um, uh, if the demand is such, uh, I, can, I can maybe put something together uh, that's properly footnoted that would give people mm -hmm. uh, a direct a direct line into where some of this information mm -hmm. uh, came from. But like I say, it would be a bit of an undertaking. And uh, like I say, that depends on the demand. Right, right. Um, so one of my questions is, um, what type of new information did you come across that you may not have known about prior to doing your research? Uh, there's about three things that seem to stick out, at least for me. One, we have all, myself included, been led to believe that, you know, Spotswood was the mining guru and, you know, he thought of all this. That's, it's simply not true. And what I've showed you today, if that doesn't show you, there were other people that were trying to do the same thing and actually influenced him, that would be probably one of them, okay? The fact that he was able to make something out of it where as it appears no one else could, is saying something in itself. The next thing would be Graffin Reed's prominent part in this whole, in this whole story. Um, the Germans, in my opinion, come to Virginia and come to, Vir uh, come to Germana because Graffin Reed feels, I think, safe in Virginia and feels that it's the place to come versus Carolina or anywhere else. So those would probably be the two big ones uh, that, that, that I really uh, uh, enjoyed finding out myself. Wonderful. And doing your research, were there any new historical figures that you came across that you really didn't know about before that you found to be very fascinating in the story of, of pre-Germana? Uh, probably the biggest one is I'd heard of Lawson and Lawson, reading Lawson's book uh, led me to Franz Ludwig Michel, who is an interesting character in itself. 
you know, of all the things, connections he made uh, in America, you know, with William Penn and the proprietors of Carolina and th through George Ritter with the, with the uh, Queen Anne grants and everything, unbelievably, I could find no reference to a mine or minerals ever be being discovered hmm. in the areas that he said that these things were at. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> Go figure. In fact, one article I read was called Michelle's Mysterious Minds. I concur. <laughs> well, I had um, someone was saying Richard was uh, mentioning a book called, I think it was Westward from Virginia by an Alan Weisland. Are you familiar with that book? It talks yeah, about Watson and Lutterer. Yes, that, that book mainly covers, uh, if it's the one I think it is, it's got pictures of covered wagons and stuff on the front of it. And it's, it's a really good detailed book for probably 1750 on, but I'm familiar with it. It does mention the Knights of the Golden Horseshoe, mm -hmm. et cetera, in it. Yes, I'm familiar. Got it. Excellent. And uh, Mark wanted to know, were there any coffee houses, taverns, or clubs where it was known that the men interested in Virginia or Carolina um, would be found? Uh, you know, there, there probably were, um, but I didn't run across anything like that. Um, there are obviously some really well-known ones. I can't think of off the top of my head, but I'm sure there was some places where they congregated and talked social, political, and business aspects. Mm-hmm. And I know that we have um, two archaeology sessions coming up after yours. Right. Um, and we have a, I know we have a few folks who may not be completely familiar with Fort Germana. Would you be able to share with us the description that Fontaine provides? Since I think he's the only person to have actually provided a contemporary account of the fort. Yes, he did. Uh, a Pentagon with a Pentagon blockhouse with 10, 10 cabins or houses with 20 feet away, all their hog and chicken houses, like a 20 foot alley, um, and two, I'm hoping, uh, three pound brass barreled cannons sitting there. My goodness, wow. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Dennis. This has been a fascinating topic. A lot of people are saying they learned a lot. And again, 